a problem of data. And uh, Mehdi talked about data apocalypse. So I think this is the perfect transition for Arno because Arno will talk about the green data is the new big data. So Arno will talk a lot about data today. Uh, so Arno, if I see your screen, so I think yeah. I can hear. Hi, Nicolas. Hi, perfect. So the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Camera. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being connected to this webinar about uh, data, greener data architecture, how to make data architectures greener. So nice to meet you. I'm a da data architect with a bit of experience. And uh, at Epon Technologies, I'm lucky enough to manage a team of almost uh, 50 guys, data architects, engineers, and scientists. In my personal life, when I'm not lo locked down, I love to uh, I love mountain physical activities like ski and cheese fondue. But uh, enough talking of me, and let's start. My uh, pretty ambitious program for this talk is to explain you what data architects do for a living and show you what the cloud service providers deal with you, deal with in your place and why this is a good idea to take a serverless approach. I, uh, also, I'd also like to give you a couple of advices on your data journey uh, under the form of best practices. And most of all, I will walk through walk you through an end-to-end -end serverless architecture. Uh, so we will do a deep dive on this kind of architecture. Uh, I will try to make this fun because we all spend a lot of time uh, watching webinars. So I will try to keep everyone uh, focused by showing some uh, picture about movies, and you will need to find a. Uh, what what um, is is uh, the movie represented? So this one is quite easy. Uh, at the beginning of my career, data was mostly database administration. So back in two thousand and six, I remember uh, having to set up a uh, no record system on the Unix uh, AIX uh, system without Stack Overflow because Stack Overflow wa was launched in two thousand and eight. So it was quite challenging. And um, around 2008, I began playing with uh, SOR architectures. It was not yet a lot of fun, and it wasn't a bit popular. In 2014, I took an eight weeks course called Introduction to Data Science from University of Washington. And uh, I kind of instantly became way cooler. Now, on a zero to broad scale, Data guys are pretty high among IT guys, of course, but uh, it didn't grow my hairs back. That's for another miracle. Data is not complicated. What could define the data project? My definition, it's when you treat data that were produced in other applications. So basically, you take data from A, apply a transformation, and then store it back to B. Of course, data science is a bit more complicated than that, but it's getting easier year after year when you have some innovative uh, data solution that help you leverage uh, either uh, pre-trained models or uh, high-level API services to uh, do either predictions or classification or image recognition on your data. So, you already know the answer to that question because Stefano just explained this, it to us in detail. So you already know that machines are the most polluting in data. Uh, it's uh, and most of all smartphones because they, they use uh, rare earth metals. Smartphones as well. So we. At our uh, individual level, we can we can try to keep our devices as uh, long as possible to reduce that kind of pollution. But of course, to watch this webinar, we also need infrastructures and networks. 
and uh, that one is difficult we can difficultly uh, avoid using that kind of uh, infrastructures and uh, what i will talk about today are data centers to run a service on network appliance we stack everything in data centers and uh, as of today they use around eight percent of the electricity produced in the us and the prediction for 2030 is around 21 percent that's humongous so let's see how we can try to keep the energy usage as low as possible in data architectures uh, in this scene the pilot asks the kid if he ever been to a Turkish in a Turkish prison. But well, uh, data centers are often as impregnable as prisons uh, because handling cooling, redundancy, disaster recovery, and Linux installation is not a lot of fun. So when I can let others do the dirty work, I get I gladly do so. Even when your data are highly sensitive, you can use public cloud, but then you will keep your private keys on your own infrastructure. Personally, I prefer taking time on business questions than on technical issues. That's why I love the cloud. Before, in my work as a data architect, I, it took me a lot of time to, uh, to make things work as expected, for example, to install the right uh, libraries on the various node of a cluster. No, with uh, cloud infrastructure and the massive usage of uh, DevOps approach and uh, infrastructure as code, I can um, be sure that uh, everything is uh, codable, testable, and I can uh, run uh, things much faster and uh, work uh, a lot of on the um, data value creation and that's far more interesting to me okay sorry for that oh, this one won't go so okay what brings serverless into that? Um, the other advantage is that you, you don't have to be a genius anymore to optimize your resources. Cloud service providers optimize the computing power in real time, depending on the demand. That saves a lot of energy and that saves money and that saves, of course, a lot of time for cloud architects. So as you can see on the right hand side, um, over provisioning is bad because it will cost you uh, a lot of money and uh, it will uh, cost energy. Under provisioning is also a bad pattern because uh, you can you will not meet your demand and you can lose uh, eventually customers. And um, delayed allocation is also a problem because you will won't be able to um, to react in a timely manner. So uh, that are the kind of challenges we face when we design a cloud uh, architectures a cloud architecture but as soon as you can use a serverless solution it will be handled by the cloud service provider or by the uh, saas solution provider in your stead and that's uh, a really good approach you also need as a best practice to know in what format you will uh, want to store your data sets. Uh, like on these pictures, with a beautiful parketed floor, my favorite format is parquet because it's both compressed and columnar. So it's really um, optimized for your, uh, for depending on your access patterns, but you can also use other kind of, of format for your um, data lake storage like Avro or ORC. Whatever the format you choose, it's got to be compressed because um, it's, of course, occupy less uh, storage volume when it's compressed, but also it requires far less, um, far less uh, processing power. So compression is a key um, is, is a key key point to have when you design an architecture. But encryption is also really important for security issue. And most of the time in, uh, in the cloud, 
it's only um, it's only a checkbox to to check to have a uh, data encrypted at rest. So do not hesitate to to leverage it. Uh, the data journey um, for the four guys on the picture, their compic trip uh, was not exactly as they expected, especially for the hat with the guy with for the guy with the hat. But a classical data journey look like this. So you need to go through the four main layers of a data platform, which are ingestion layer, storage layer, either uh, structured, semi-structured, or unstructured storage. You also have to transform your data to take them from A to B and to transform it, of course, to create some value of the data. So you will have the uh, analytics framework, such as Spark, or you will have also the uh, machine learning uh, processing. And of course, a presentation layer to make it available to end users. Uh, and that can be uh, reporting tools that, um, that can also be API. So um, my advice is when you design a data platform, don't take the technological point of view and don't start from the source, but instead start from the user. Because if you, uh, if you question your user, they can tell you that they need only their data, their report once a day or even sometime once a week and only on the three last months worth of data. So you won't need to uh, ingest years or years of, of data to ingest and keep years or years on data, uh, even if it's doable. But uh, according to the user's need, you will manage only a small amount of data uh, on a weekly basis, so in a batch manner, and that will cost far less. And, um, and in terms of cost, of course, and of uh, energy. But to optimize that, you need to think your data platform to be serverless and transient to be sure to pay only what you consume. Uh, if you don't have a machine to go inside your customer mind, you will need some uh, ideation techniques. And uh, one that I uh, use to, to to, to use uh, for my uh, in my um, engagement uh, is the ideation um, data innovation board and I start by exploring the use cases with the main user what does he want uh, what are the existing data what market facts are relevant for this use case once you have gathered that uh, intelligence you can start to ideate and to um, dig a bit deeper inside the, the use case, for example, by asking uh, what value should the use case provide to the users? And uh, what are the risks if we do not develop that use case? What additional data would we need to conduct that use case? So that's always um, kind of a refin refinement process to go um, layer after layer inside the um, inside the use case to be sure that we will uh, be able to evaluate it and um, to understand, of course, the value it will produce, but also how the users will interact with that use case, through which channels will they interact. Um, because when you start asking uh, a user what he will need, uh, most of the time they will answer um, a report or a dashboard because this is the most common way of interacting with data. But in some situation, for example, in call centers, um, people don't have time to uh, to search in a dashboard, etc. So they want things to be um, to be contextual with their business, contextual with the user interactions, and sometimes you need data pushed directly on your smartphone, or uh, you need data prepared before your next meeting or your next customer interaction. So it's really important to evaluate uh, the way the the user want to consume that uh, the valuable information you prepared on your platform. This is 
what a typical serverless data journey could look like. Uh, it's less complicated than the reality inside the reality inside another reality, but I will try to explain it to you uh, uh, either way. So as you see, it represents the data journey. You have the sources on the left and you have a server. You can have a, I designed that uh, architecture with AWS uh, services, but you can do that on uh, um, most of the uh, cloud service providers. And I chose to, to develop the ingestion with uh, AWS Lambda, which is a serverless, uh, a serverless framework. So you only, you don't need to operate your servers, but only to, to, to commit your, to submit your, your code. And, um, to do the storage, I use, um, uh, for the bronze and silver that are maturity levels, I use the uh, Amazon S3 object storage. And there is a new data preparation service that has been launched uh, three, three days ago that is called Glue Data Brew. And it's a um, visual data prep tool that can uh, really accelerate the way you will um, normalize and, uh, and uh, improve the quality of your data. Once your data have been uh, normalized, and of course I didn't tell you, but my AWS Lambda will store data in a in a compressed format, so most of the time in pocket. And uh, once your data have been uh, prepared, they will be stored in a silver S3 area and load uh, into Snowflake, which is a data cloud, so a data platform um, in a SaaS. And uh, it will load. It will be loaded into a silver uh, database, um, prepared with a set of uh, of um, even event-based tasks, and stored in the right schema. Most of the time, stored uh, old uh, database. So uh, on that gold database, I can plug uh, any kind of uh, visual tool. I chose uh, the one from Amazon, but uh, Tableau, ThoughtSpot, uh, and other, uh, other tools would do. And uh, your user will interact on that tool. And now uh, you can, with some tool like ThoughtSpot, for example, you can have some um, natural language query. Uh, and it's now possible. I didn't try it yet, but it's now possible to do so with uh, Amazon QuickSight. Uh, uh, it was announced, announced uh, last week. So let me check the time. Okay, I'm not too bad. I'm uh, already at my conclusion, so we will have a time to um, to discuss and to interact. Um, the last movie reference is my favorite movie of all time, and um, it's not very relevant with that subject. About that, when you have a good strategy, you don't need to have a lot of money or a lot of developers. You can build innovative and cost-effective data platform by asking the right questions and using as more serverless or SaaS solutions as possible. That's what we like to call green by design data architectures. To conclude, I hope you learned a couple of things during this presentation and that it was not too boring. And now let's see the movies. So, there were, I think there are pretty much awesome movies, uh, maybe apart from uh, Finding Never Neverland, but the, the, the meme it was too tempting. And all, uh, most of you have seen uh, all these movies, I'm sure, but if you don't, uh, uh, I recommend them to you. <laughs> and uh, as a of co conclusion, if you want to discuss data architectures, do not hesitate to contact me. We can also conduct um, data maturity assessment to see uh, if your um, uh, current arch architectures will meet your expectation and, and will uh, support your st data strategy. Thank you, everyone, and uh, I'm ready for the questions. Thank you, Arnaud, and thank you for the guidance uh, regarding uh, movies. So. <laughs> A quick uh, fact that if you want to to, to see uh, movies on Netflix, you should uh, reduce the quality because video streaming is for sure has for sure an impact. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, let's move to the the Q and A the Q and A session. Um, there is a question from Eddie. In 
regarding green data or small data or less data, a lot of data scientists explain that uh, working with huge quantity of data is just a lack of understanding. So maybe the question for you is, do you see real customer projects that, that have a, a strategy in terms of data usage and life cycle? Or do they only store data because they are afraid to miss something? Um, that's more a way of conducting, I think, the um, use case uh, framing and definition. Um, most of the time, there is a trade-off when data platforms are, um, are driven uh, by the IT and not the business, uh, because uh, we have the capacity to store uh, a huge amount of data. Uh, actually, it's limitless because um, mm -hmm. cloud service provider for you a limitless storage capacity. But when your job is not to uh, be like Google and to index uh, everything, you should apply lifecycle policies to reduce the um, amount of data and to cool down the data you don't use a lot. And uh, as Mehdi said, um, working with huge quantity of data is a lack of understanding. It's a lack of understanding the business needs, the end user need. Um, this is not... Uh, when you are... Uh, sometime in my uh, different um, engagement, um, I meet some uh, some IT that want to have something in real time with uh, uh, where you can um, uh, drill down inside uh, like 12 months on, uh, of data. But when I discussed with the uh, end user, he, t he tell me uh, that he, he only needs the last uh, the last uh, three months of data, and it can be once uh, once a week. So. Mm -hmm. We always want the best possible architecture because it will serve the, the less uh, uh, demanding use cases. But we shouldn't do that. We should, uh, our, my conviction and uh, our conviction at uh, Ipon is that um, we should uh, only design uh, um, architecture to serve actual use cases and not a potential future use cases. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And j just a last question um, from Philippe, and I will change the question a little bit. So do you see difference between cloud providers' data solution? Uh, I mean that is greener data is a choice of provider, a choice of architecture, or both? Um, both. It's a choice of provider because uh, as Philip said, uh, not all of them are uh, very uh, transparent. For example, uh, the, I think uh, Google is uh, most transparent yet. But um, of course, the more tenant there will be on, in a cloud service provider, the more um, neutralized will will the resources resources be so when you use a serverless uh, solution with a lot of tenants um, there will be some scale factor that will reduce uh, the, the the number of servers and uh, in, in a follow the sun approach um, th that that resources can be uh, distributed among uh, different um, ge geographical area. So it's, uh, I think it's more efficient when you use one of the three biggest um, cloud service providers because of the, the scale factor and also because of the maturity of the serverless solutions. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh... Arno, for your time and your presentation. Uh, ben, you had a question regarding code. Uh, I suggest that you you will see the afternoon presentation because we will have a lot of presentation from developer and, and focusing on code. So thanks a lot, Arno, uh, for your presentation. It was a pleasure. And have a good one. Thank you.